coming up. It's 1984 all over again. It's not something that I ever thought I would see in the United States. Millions are being singled out for thought crime. Big Brother's victims issue a chilling warning for Americans. This is it. There's nowhere for us to go. And then he grabbed a lighter. And he began to burn our wedding pictures. She grabbed a knife. I ran in the kitchen and got the knives. And I told him I was going to kill him. What saved this explosive marriage on today's 700 Club? Well, welcome, folks, to this edition of the 700 Club. They will not stop, and they never intended to. The nation of Iran is enriching uranium as never before in pursuit of the ultimate weapon, a nuclear bomb. And now Iran's intelligence minister has made an unprecedented threat. What is it? And could it trigger nuclear war between Israel, Iran, and the U.S.? Here's Chris Mitchell from Jerusalem. Iran's intelligence minister issued the warning. He claimed Iran's nuclear program is peaceful, and Iran's supreme leader Khamenei issued a fatwa forbidding a nuclear weapon. But he added, if pressured, Iran could change course. If a cat is cornered, it may show a kind of behavior that a free cat would not. If Iran is pushed in that direction, then it wouldn't be Iran's fault, but those who pushed it. Under normal circumstances, Iran does not have such a program and intent at all. But these are not normal circumstances. Alavi's threat comes after Iran announced it's now enriching uranium one step away from military-grade uranium and researching uranium metal, a key component of a nuclear bomb. As we see it, Iran will not stop enriching uh, uranium. They never want to do. They don't today, and they will not in the future. While the enrichment goes on, Iran, Khamenei and President Biden are in a face-off. Khamenei says no new deal unless the U.S. lifts sanctions. And Biden says no sanctions relief unless Iran returns to the negotiating table. Will the U.S. lift sanctions first in order to get Iran back to the negotiating table? No. They have to stop enriching uranium first. Here in Israel on Tuesday, Israel Defense Forces estimated Iran is two years from getting a nuclear bomb. Secretary of State Antony Blinken recently said they might be weeks away. But some say it's simply a political decision by Iran's leaders. Technologically and scientifically, we don't see the time as a real problem. So it's not, it's not the time problem, so you can say weeks or months or a year or two years, only about the political situation you want to represent. In the meantime, Israel's chief of staff has already said Israel's military is preparing operational plans in case Israel needs to attack Iran's nuclear facilities. Well, Chris is here with us. Chris, you know, the Iranians believe in what's called the Mahdi, the 12th Iman, and they believe that there'll be devastation before the 12th Iman is revealed. So they wouldn't mind killing a whole lot of people with a nuclear weapon. I mean, am I right in that assumption? No, exactly, Pat. We've reported on that for several years. In fact, uh, former president from Iran, uh, uh, Kokemani, uh, he said that it was going to be part of the, the imam, just like you said. It was going to be what they wanted to do to precept the coming of the Mahdi. Uh, a nuclear weapon is exactly what they would need to go ahead and do that. And not only would it, would it perhaps precipitate the coming of the Mahdi, as you said, but it was also, uh, you know, just create that chaos, exactly what the Mahdi is required uh, before he comes. Well, the Israelis are not taking this stuff lying down. What would an Israeli strike look like? Well, they already have operational plans. You know, uh, General Kovavi said the other day that they were preparing operational plans. But, you know, Pat, we've talked about this for years. And you know that the IDF has those plans. Uh, the general is sending a signal both to the U.S. and Iran that they would uh, go unilaterally if they needed to. So others, other Israeli leaders are sending the same signal. What would, they have, what would they use 
in a possible strike. F-35s, they have a lot of F-35s from the U.S. They would use tankers to be able to get those F-35s, F-16s, and any other uh, warplanes to Iran. They would also probably incorporate special operations uh, during that time. And you know, right now, uh, Pat, they can fly over Saudi airspace because the Saudis, the UAE, all these Gulf states see Iran as a, a, a existential threat, not only to them, but to Israel as well. And, you know, they would probably uh, also have covert operations as well. And, uh, you know, you would the assassination of Iran's chief nuclear scientist uh, just a few weeks ago, some people believe by, Iran, uh, by Israel, uh, was just a, a sample of what they could do. Well, now, what's the meaning of this Iran's intelligence minister? What's behind that? Well, certainly it's pressure on President Biden, Pat, and uh, some are calling it extortion. And what you've seen recently is a crescendo of orchestrated threats. First of all, they said they would enrich uranium more than the nuclear deal allows. Then they went to enrich uranium to 20 percent, one step from weapons grade. Now they're researching uranium metal. The only use for that is a nuclear weapon. And so now this threat by Iran's intelligence chief, and it's not the only one, Pat, a major newspaper said in a headline recently, why Iran must seek a nuclear bomb. So what they want desperately right now is to get the U.S. to take away these economic sanctions that have crippled Iran's economy. What are the Israelis telling you that they look for the Biden administration? Well, right now, first of all, uh, Pat, they're waiting for a phone call. Uh, president Biden hasn't yet called the prime minister uh, while he's been president. He did call him right after the November election. The White House has kind of dismissed it. But here in Israel, uh, it, it's very concerning. So it looks like the Mossad chief, Yossi Cohen, might be the point man on the Iranian nuclear deal with Israel. He's supposed to meet with the president about that. Now, if they wanted anything, Pat, they're in, if they had their druthers, they don't want a nuclear deal at all. But if there was a nuclear deal, they would, first of all, want no sunset clauses, which the 2015 nuclear deal had. They want no money for terror. In 2015, that deal gave Iran billions of dollars. That went to Hezbollah and other proxies here in the region. So that's what they want. They would also want uh, ballistic missiles, part of that, uh, that inspection. And uh, they want inspection of military sites. So if, if they had their drivers, they don't want a nuclear deal at all. And I think that's the message Israel and perhaps uh, Mossad chief Yossi Cohen will be sending to the administration. Uh, Chris, uh, if I could ask you, what's your gut feeling about this whole thing? Do you think Israel is going to strike them? Well, Pat, you know, it seems like a perfect storm, and I'm not sure it goes to that measure, but it's certainly ill winds blowing. My gut says it's, uh, it's ratcheted to a level that I haven't seen, uh, you know, with Iran finally coming out in the open and saying, you know, if we could, we could go and have a nuclear weapon. Uh, and then Israel, and not only just the general uh, chief of staff, but other Israelis are saying, you know, we'll go ahead and, and strike Iran if we has to. For Israel right now, I think the pressure on them is like they don't see the kind of ally they had in the Trump administration. And they're saying if Iran is going to keep pressuring and crossing our red lines, we may just go ahead and have to strike Iran. Uh, my gut feeling is probably something's going to happen to prevent that. But uh, it's really, really serious uh, right now here, Pat, with, uh, with all this scenario, with what's going on in Washington, Tehran, and Jerusalem. Uh, we'll see what happens. Certainly it'd be time to be praying for the protection of Israel and the peace of Jerusalem. Well, Chris, thank you, friend, for the terrific report. Chris Mitchell, our head of, of our news department over in Israel, and it's just a wonderful report, but it's a frightening thing to think. I, I don't think that God's going to allow uh, this world to be blown up with a nuclear explosion. I, I just don't think that's in the cards. But uh, it's certainly something we, we need to watch because it's very real. It's, it's not something that's being delayed for a year or two. I mean, it's something that could happen in the next few weeks. Well, in other news, a terrifying 13-minute video of the Capitol riot. That's what Democrats used to help push forward the impeachment trial of former President Trump. Six Republican senators also voted to declare the trial constitutional. So what was the last minute surprise? Capitol Hill correspondent Abigail Robertson has the details on that. 
House impeachment managers opened their part of the impeachment debate with a chilling 13-minute video of the January 6th Capitol attack. It showed clips from Trump's speech to supporters on the day of the riot. After this, we're going to walk down, and I'll be there with you. We're going to walk down. We're going to walk down to the Capitol. Then it mixed in video of the mob storming through the Capitol barricades and attacking police officers. That's a high crime and misdemeanor. If that's not an impeachable offense, then there is no such thing. House impeachment managers, led by Congressman Jamie Raskin, argued a Senate decision that it's unconstitutional to impeach a president that's left office would set a dangerous precedent. It's an invitation to the president to take his best shot at anything he may want to do on his way out the door, including using violent means to lock that door, to hang on to the Oval Office at all costs, and to block the peaceful transfer of power. While Trump's lawyers denounced the rioters, they also argued their client's speech is protected by the Constitution. We can't be thinking about that. We can't possibly be suggesting that we punish people for political speech in this country. And accuse Democrats of abusing impeachment for political gain. A great many Americans see this process for exactly what it is, a chance by a group of partisan politicians seeking to eliminate Donald Trump from the American political scene and seeking to disenfranchise 74 million plus American voters. But the House impeachment manager's argument eventually won the day. If I'm an impartial juror and I'm trying to make a decision based upon uh, the facts as presented on this issue, then the House managers did a much better job. After the opening debate, Republican Senator Bill Cassidy joined five GOP colleagues and each Democrat in voting the trial is constitutional, a measure Cassidy voted against just last week. They made a compelling argument. President Trump's team were disorganized. They did everything they could but to talk about the question at hand. And when they talked about it, they kind of glided over it, almost as if they were embarrassed of their arguments. While a few other GOP senators acknowledge the House impeachment managers have presented a strong argument so far, the Senate still needs a two-thirds majority vote to convict President Trump, which as of now seems unlikely. Reporting from Washington, Abigail Robertson, CBN News. Thanks, Abigail. Well, if you'd like a, a fearless prediction from yours truly, I predict that this nonsense is going on which you know is, is quixotic. It's not going, they can't possibly win. Uh, they, you know there's no way that the Senate two thirds is gonna vote uh, to impeach Trump. And you know, they, they're just not gonna do that. And so they're wasting a huge amount of time, wasting a lot of money and wasting a lot of, uh, of energy in doing something that won't work. And so I believe coming the next uh, midterm elections, the House of Representatives is going to flip back to the uh, Republicans because there are a lot of vulnerable Democrats who are going to go down because of this foolishness and also because of higher taxes and regulations and all the stuff that's coming down uh, as socialists that the American people don't want. So mark my words, this thing will backfire on the Democrats. They should never have done it. It's a waste of time. It won't work. They, they, they're not gonna, it's not gonna be the two thirds in the Senate to, to impeach the president. So we're wasting a huge amount of time when we should be concerned about the infrastructure. We should be concerned about COVID. We should be concerned about helping people who are suffering and don't have enough food to eat, et cetera. They're not doing that and they're gonna pay the price. Terry? Well, still ahead, <clears throat> hearts and flowers. That's how this couple started out their marriage. So why did he wind up setting their wedding pics on fire? And you won't believe what she did next.
That's coming up. Plus, censored, doxxed, deplatformed, blacklisted, or demonetized, Trump supporters are being rooted out and punished. Who's raising the alarm about this toxic trend? Find out after this. Hi, this is Pat Robertson. We don't know what the future holds for different tech companies, but we always want to be able to share the good news through the media. So I want to invite you to watch our program on cbnfamily.com or download the CBN Family app. This way you can have direct access to the 700 Club and other specials from CBN and you won't miss a thing. Now just click below to get more details and watch with us. Tomorrow, trapped. He began to tell me things like, no one is looking for you. In the world of sex trafficking. This is my new life and I just better accept it. The threats. If you go back home, I know exactly where you're gonna be at and I'm gonna find you and I'll kill you. And her daring escape. I'm gonna try to run and live today or today he's gonna kill me and I'm gonna die on tomorrow's 700 Club. Stay connected with CBN News all day across our platforms. Well, it happened in Venezuela. It happened in Nazi Germany. It happened in communist Poland. It went on down the line. Could it happen here? I wish to say, no, it couldn't, but the answer is yes. Called crazy, censored, blacklisted and beyond, Americans are being rooted out and punished for their support of former President Trump. This vile treatment smacks of, well, they call it McCarthyism, but this is much worse. And even more disturbing parallels. Dale Hurd has an alarming report about what we're talking about. This was an attorney for PBS caught on camera saying the children of Trump supporters should be taken away from their parents and put in re-education camps. He was later fired, while voices in the media still call for Trump supporters to be deprogrammed. There are millions of Americans, um, almost all white, almost all Republicans, who somehow need to be deprogrammed. And the question is, how are we going to really almost deprogram these people who have signed up for the cult of Trump? Trump supporters are also being called mentally ill and are being censored, doxxed, deplatformed, blacklisted, and demonetized. It's giving some who have lived in communist countries flashbacks. For those who lived under communist dictatorships, What's happening in America has some disturbing parallels. Chinese pastor Bob Fu was a student leader during the Tiananmen Square pro-democracy demonstrations in 1989. He was also a proud attendee of the January 6th Trump rally on the National Mall. He says the call to re-educate and deprogram Trump supporters is straight out of the Chinese Communist Party playbook. It's absolutely uh, these kind of tactics. Uh, they all requires forced conformity. And if you don't comply, then you will be punished. Elizabeth Rogliani's family had to flee Venezuela when Hugo Chavez took power. Her video warning last year to Americans about the similarities between the Antifa and Black Lives Matter rioting and what happened in Venezuela went viral. I have already lived through this thing when I was living in Venezuela. She says the labeling of Trump supporters as potential domestic terrorists was a tactic Hugo Chavez used to stigmatize his political opposition. Calling out opposition or Republicans as terrorists or fascists, that is the kind of language I saw a lot. Uh, late President Hugo Chavez used to call us fascists and terrorists as well. Rogliani says one ominous sign for America has been all the conservatives flocking to more secure messaging platforms like Telegram, because that's exactly what happened in Venezuela when the Democratic opposition was deplatformed and opposition leaders began to be arrested. We jumped into Telegram really early on, so I had it for years. 
I find that very interesting how it's happening so fast here. Jason Poblet's grandfather had to flee Cuba when Fidel Castro took power. Poblet, an attorney who has worked in Congress, is president of the Global Liberty Alliance and says what happened in Cuba is replaying in the United States. Dale, it's painful to watch. It's not something that I ever thought I would see in the United States. In Cuba, the socialist facilitators had been laying the groundwork. And by the time Fidel Castro rolled in, uh, they had already laid that framework in place to take the government over. German evangelist and author Heidi Munt grew up in former communist East Germany, which called itself the German Democratic Republic. And she has harsh words for America's Democrats. Your Democrats remind me to the German Democratic Republic, so the communist part of Germany, the east part of Germany. They also called themselves Democrats, but they were socialists, communists. When Heidi, as a young woman, began to speak out against the East German government, she paid the price. My career stopped, you know, it was broken. So I could not find a job anymore. Dissidents in East Germany and the old Soviet bloc were also called mentally ill and sent to hospitals, as they are today in China. Children were also taken away from dissidents. In East Germany, um, they took away, they really took away children. They put them in, um, in orphanages and uh, the parents did not get them back. Yeah. These voices warning Americans are not alone. Polish Prime Minister Mateusz Morawiecki has compared the treatment of President Trump to Poland's communist era. Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny, sentenced last week to two years in a penal colony by Vladimir Putin's Russian government, called Donald Trump's Twitter ban an unacceptable act of censorship. All this, uh, you know, the platforming, this kind of thing are exactly happening in China. They're using the similar tactics with the same playbook. Jason Poblet said if his grandfather, who loved America deeply, was alive today to see how Trump supporters are being demonized, he would be scared. And then he would tell me, hey, Jason, what are you doing about it? <laughs> because you can't go anywhere. I mean, this is it. There's nowhere for us to go. Dale Hurd, CBN News. Life, Dale, it's frightening, it's penetrating, but we've got to be aware of it. The 44 million people voted for Trump, and uh, it has nothing to do so much with Trump as the whole idea of freedom. We want freedom, but Hugo Chavez ruined Venezuela, destroyed the country, absolutely destroyed it. And what happened in East Germany? Terrible things happened. What happened in Poland? Terrible things. We cannot let that happen here in America. Cannot let it happen. And so the question is right now, you need to speak up and not take it lying down. You can't just say, oh, well, uh, you know, that's just one of those things. No, it's not just one of those things. It's one of those things we cannot allow to happen in America because of that Cuban man said, where can we go now? There is no other refuge for dissidents than the United States of America. If America falls, the whole world is going to be destroyed because there's no powerful champion of liberty and freedom. And we cannot let this stuff happen in America. Terry. Well, up next, she never had a speeding ticket. She worked with children and she ran her own business. So what did this woman do to her husband that put her behind bars? And how did it save their marriage? You have to see it to believe it. It's coming up. Hi folks, this is Pat Robertson, and I want to thank you for watching The 700 Club. Now make sure to click the subscribe button below so you'll never miss an episode. The team at CBN always reads and responds to your comments and prayer requests, so keep them coming. Well, it's the sound of trumpets, ladies and gentlemen. We've got a special announcement. A special announcement. Next Wednesday, February the 17th, we're going to have a special edition of the 700 Club, which is going to feature you, your voicemail questions. 
Now, if you have a, a question about life or about the Bible, or about anything you want to call about, there's a special number on the screen right now. And you can call today only. But if you get on that call, your call will be taken and put on the air a week from today. It's only until 5 p.m. Eastern Time to leave your voicemail question. Here is the number. It's 800 toll free 677 7884. Let's get that again. 1 800 677 7884. Write that number down. I'll leave it up a few more minutes. You call and we'll be answering your voicemail next Wednesday, February the 17th. As always, people really look forward to that. I look forward to it because, you know, it, it's, it's just fun to hear what you want to have answered. And this is. Vox Populi, the voice of the people, and your voice. And I, again, I want to give you that number one more time. It's only today, and you get the number in, and it's a week from now we'll have that special show. It's 1 800, write it down, 677 7884. You can call in, somebody will take your call and record what you have to say. Next Wednesday we'll have the show. Okay? Terry. A toxic showdown. He grabbed a lighter. She grabbed several knives. So what happened next? And how did this couple's marriage survive? You're about to find out. The thing that I loved about her when I first saw her is that she was a woman that looked like she knew where she was going. She looked like that she knew what her purpose was. After more than 25 years of marriage, James and Tripina relish date night. They reminisce on how their love story began. I fell in love with him because his heart was after God, and that was something that was attractive to me. James proposed during their church service on New Year's Eve, and in 1993, the couple married with hopes of a beautiful beginning. But their busy lives created challenges they didn't expect. When we got married, we were just working, running, ripping, trying to take care of the kids, trying to make money. We weren't really focusing on each other anymore, focusing on really getting out, dating, and doing those things that we did before we got married and that took a toll on the marriage over time. Then there were money problems. Early on, Trifina struggled to carry the family's financial load on her own. Her hair salon brought in good business, but James' work as a contractor wasn't as successful as he hoped for. You know, my pride was like, I don't want to go get a regular job because this is what I do. I do floors, and she would be telling me like, look, you need to do something. You need to do something else. And I'm like, well, I'm, you see me out here. I'm trying every day. I work hard every day but it wasn't enough. But it wasn't enough. I'd call them lazy. I was like, they don't know you at church. Their disagreements over money escalated over the years. In 2011, another argument about finances led the couple to their darkest moment. I'd asked him to pay the house and um, he said he would, but he took all the money out of my account and didn't put any of his money in there. I threw the check, my checkbook at her, and I was like, this is your guy. I grabbed our wedding pictures, and I started to rip them. And I said, this is what I think of us. And he got a lighter and began to burn our wedding pictures. I ran in the kitchen and got the knives, and I told him I was going to kill him. And I was trying to take the knives out of her hand. When she uh, yanked, she cut my hand. But by that time, the police had been called. I never had a speeding ticket. I worked with kids. I had a beauty salon and all of these things. And my marriage was broken. Trifina was taken to jail. After facing a judge, she was released on the condition that she attend anger management and marriage counseling with James. Their pastor recommended a 16-week program at their church aimed at strengthening marriages. Once we both started doing that, then it was like, okay, let me work on me. Let me work on what I need to do. How can I be a better husband to you? How can I be a better father to my children? Eventually, they both began to share their hearts. You know, I was a very passive person. You know, I would let people take advantage of me, that type of thing, because I, I didn't have a lot of good, I didn't have good self-esteem. I needed to be softer. I needed to be taken care of. He needed someone to encourage him. By the end of the program, their love and commitment to their marriage had been renewed. I forgave her and I knew that she had really forgiven me then. I think healing really began to happen. It, I mean, God began to heal us both and bring healing in our marriage. I got a different job and, and started, you know, being the head of my household, started making sure things were taken care of. That really turned things around too, because now she, it wasn't this stress on her. 
Today, James and Trifina say surviving their challenges has made their relationship stronger. They serve in ministry and speak out about issues married couples are facing. We don't let things build up. When we have a disagreement, we really do talk about them. We talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly. So being honest and truthful and just being able to date each other. But one of the most important things is prayer and asking God to come in daily. In their book, Marriage Reloaded, they share their story along with lessons that have added to the success of their lasting marriage. You know, we've raised three beautiful daughters. To see their dreams come to pass, that brings joy to my heart. To see my wife doing what she, she loves to do and to the things that we're planning to do together. Now, they treat every day as an occasion to cherish the true meaning of love. Valentine's Day is every day for us. When I wake up in the morning and look at her, when I see her, I'm like, I get excited every day. I'm so grateful that God didn't let me throw my diamonds and my pearls away. God is the threefold cord in our marriage that's not easily broken. Without him, we could have never made it. You know, marriage is hard, and we want to help you with yours by telling you what God has to say about marriage, because it really is His plan. So if you're struggling in your marriage, or you just like to make your marriage stronger than it already is, we've got a wonderful pamphlet we'd like to share with you. It's Love and Marriage, God's Plan for Your Family. It's free, and so is the number to get it. You just call our toll-free number, 1-800-700-7000, and say, I'd like the Love and Marriage booklet. We'll get it out to you right away. Also want you to know you can watch more stories of love and marriage like the Richardsons on the CBN Family app now through February 14th. Check out our special section dedicated to Valentine's Day and the month of love. You can find recipes, crafts for your children, tips for singles, plus a romantic fireplace, music, and more. And best of all, it's free. So just download the CBN Family app on your smartphone, your tablet, or your TV and enjoy taking advantage of all of that. Well, still ahead, our most popular segment on YouTube, Your Questions and Pat's Honest Answers. Helen asks, how can I, as an American, protest Trump's impeachment trial? Stay tuned for Pat's answer on that and more. Plus, a pain in the neck, literally. How is this woman healed with the help of her cell phone? Stay tuned to find out. Plus, we'll be praying for you and your needs, and that's all coming up. This year, celebrate Valentine's Day with your CBN family. Join us on the CBN Family app for stories of romance, encouragement, and how the holiday began. Be sure to catch my favorite brownie recipe. And Gizmo Ghostina has a Valentine craft for the kids. Plus, you'll find some romantic dinner music just for you. Get it all on the CBN Family app, February 5th through the 14th. We want to hear your story. Send us a message or call us 1-800-700-7000. Welcome back to the 700 Club for this CBN News Break. The Dallas Mavericks won't play the national anthem before home games this season. Owner Mark Cuban confirmed his decision to ESPN and the New York Times Tuesday. Last July, Cuban tweeted, the national anthem police in this country are out of control. If you want to complain, complain to your boss and ask why they don't play the national anthem every day before you start work. Cuban says he consulted with NBA's com uh, commissioner before making his decision. Well, Seattle Seahawks quarterback Russell Wilson referenced scripture in his acceptance speech for the 2020 Walter Payton NFL Man of the Year Award. Wilson said, quote, to America, to the world, love is patient, love is kind, love changes things. The great Walter Payton once said, we are stronger together than we are alone. He continued saying, remember this one thing, love always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres, love changes things. Thank you. Wilson became a follower of Jesus Christ when he was a teenager and has been vocal about his faith ever since. Well, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at CBNNews.com. Pat and Terry will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. Do you have questions about God? Call us. It's toll free. 1-800-700-7000 or check out this link. Tomorrow, trapped 
he began to tell me things like, no one is looking for you. In the world of sex trafficking. This is my new life and I just better accept it. The threats. If you go back home, I know exactly where you're gonna be at and I'm gonna find you and I'll kill you. And her daring escape. I'm gonna try to run and live today or today he's gonna kill me and I'm gonna die. On tomorrow's 700 Club. Really, really strong, a crushing ache like a migraine. That's how Elizabeth Marquez described the pain in her neck. So how did her cell phone help her get healed? Just watch. I like to uh, go to church, uh, read my Bible, be with my family, my, my girls. Uh, my oldest is 21 and then my youngest is 13. Uh, my mom had knee surgery on October 27th of 2020. While she was in surgery, I was at the chapel praying for her and for my family. I had a uh, pain in my neck. It, it was really bad. It was like a migraine headache. It was, it was getting really, really strong. And I just prayed to God to heal it. I was in prayer, and after I finished my prayer, I got on my phone, and that's when I saw the 700 Club. I listen to Pat and Terry every day. I, I love watching them. Pat and Terry were on uh, praying for uh, the nation and for everybody there. And they called out my name, and they said Elizabeth, and I was so happy to uh, to hear my name. Elizabeth or Elizabeth, there's a whiplash, a whiplash in your neck. Reach your hand on your neck and all of a sudden all that pain, those muscles are straight, your spine is realigned in Jesus' name. Touch the Lord. Thank you. So I touched it and I'll, at, the, at the time that I touched my neck, I felt the electricity going through my neck and I knew it was Jesus. I knew it was God healing me and I was so happy and so excited and I was, I had so much joy in my heart. And as soon as he finished praying for me, the pain was gone. It was just a miracle, you know, God came through for me and he came through for my mom also. And um, it was just a great feeling in my heart, um, knowing that his presence was there and always will be there. And it, if it wasn't for Jesus and for God, I, I don't know what I, where I would be at, at this moment. Thank you. You know, we pray almost every day on That's this right. program. And, and sometimes you hear God nudge you that it's someone specific, but you don't really know Elizabeth. Exactly. I mean, no. and yet God knew her. And, and, and knew her name and what her yes. problem was. And she's listening on a tele, I mean, on a, Cell phone. Cell phone. Yeah. Okay. Well, what Amazing. else you got? Well, we've got this is Janet. She lives in Phillipsburg, Pennsylvania. Pat, she received news that her 80 year old father, Larry, was in some sort of intestinal distress and had to go to the ER. From there, he was transported to another hospital by ambulance and surgery was scheduled. Meanwhile, Janet and her husband heard this word of knowledge from you, Pat. You said someone has a bowel obstruction. It's not cancer, but you've been concerned about it. Right now, that obstruction is being taken away and the colon is going to be completely healed. So they claimed that word for Larry, her father. In those very moments, the blockage in Larry's body left. He was healed without Isn't surgery. Amen. You know, folks, God is able. Now listen to this one. Maria lives in Mattapan, Massachusetts. She felt a lump under her right arm. So she went to see her doctor and she was watching this program and heard Terry pray Someone has a painful lump under your right arm. You're very concerned. It's large enough for you to feel God's healing you. It's going to dissolve in Jesus' name. So Maria said, that's me. And guess what? The lump started dissolving, and the doctor confirmed her healing. Now, folks, you say, this sounds amazing. Not really. God is present, and I think he, we're seeing an, an anointing of the Spirit coming upon us and upon the uh, the body of Christ that is extraordinary. And I think we ought to move into that anointing and take what God has for us. So Terry and I are going to pray right now for you, your family, for the nation, whatever. 
And right now, this is the time. Believe God, and we'll believe with you. So, Father, we join hands together, and I thank you. Thank you, Lord. A peptic ulcer has just been healed. Uh, Marietta, you are just healed. You'll feel a, f a fire in your intestines. You are made whole. Terry? Now, there's someone else. You have an inflamed tongue, not, not like a sore from eating in the front, but in the back when you swallow, very sore. It is not cancer. You have an infection. God's healing that for you right now. It's going to go away. Thank you, Lord. Uh, mucosa uh, is, is being healed. There's, there's a, a problem. Benjamin, you've got this, and you know what it is. And God has just healed you. You'll feel fire going throughout your body. You are made whole. Yeah. Terry? I, I don't know if this is one person or many, but your feet are, you have a swelling in your feet that is not been diagnosed as anything, but it's so painful for you to walk. God's healing that for you right now. You're just going to begin to feel warmth in your feet, and all of that swelling is going to go away, and back, you'll be back to normal. Uh, some of you, you were, I guess, riding with the air in your, and you've got what's known as a tick, the little roux, and the ticks in your face, just reach out and touch it in the name of, of, in the name of Jesus. Mm. I, guess, I guess that's the name, is Elizabeth, touch it. Yeah. Touch and make whole. Thank you. Terry, one more. Yes, yeah, someone else, you have curvature of the spine. It, it's not bothered you most of your life, but as you've gotten older now, you have a lot of back discomfort. God is healing that for you. Feel that warmth on the lower part of your back as God just straightens it for you, and that pain is gone in Jesus' name. Amen. Listen, all over this audience, God's doing things, and we're praying for America. We're praying for this land. Jesus. Lord, we're praying for the Middle East. We're praying for Israel. Lord, rescue your people and may the anointing of the Spirit. We ask for the angels to come and deliver the people of God. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. and amen. Terry. Well, coming up, we've got your email questions. Hilda asks, are the people in heaven and hell looking at us and seeing what we do? Well, your questions and some honest answers are coming up after this. His story has inspired the world for thousands of years. While some scholars doubted his very existence. We are sharing some light on the story of David and Goliath. This is ancient, biblical Jerusalem. CBN Films presents, written in stone, House of David. For centuries, the Bible was the only evidence that David existed. Written in stone, House of David. Coming soon from CBN Films. Hear what people are saying about Pat Robertson's latest book. It is phenomenal. It's as good as any book I've ever read in my entire life. Discover the principles that guided Pat's life. Get Pat Robertson's latest book when you become a CBN partner. It's like having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with Pat. Cannot praise Pat enough for the book. Call now, 1-800-700-7000 or go to CBN.com. I appreciate all those comments about this book. Uh, it has touched a lot of lives, and I'm praying that it will touch you and bless you. But we're giving this as a gift when you join the 700 Club. So you, all you got to do is call in and say, look, I'm, I'm, I'm on board for $20 a month, and I'll send you uh, my book, I Walk with the Living God. And people really are being uh, blessed by it, I hope. Yeah. They surely are. Here, this is a um, viewer comment from Jan, who's read the book, says, I listened to Pat's book over the weekend. Pat truly walks with the living God. This book is so inspiring and faith building. Thank you for sharing your walk with us. Also, thank you that it's available as streaming audio on my computer. It's so convenient for me. I couldn't stop listening, and I was <laughs> sad when it was over. God bless you all at CBS. I don't want you to be sad. Maybe I'll have to write another one or go. something. Okay. <laughs> Well, stuck in a low-paying, dead-end job, Steve never dreamed that within a year he'd be top salesman and receive a huge bonus. Since then, the sky's been the limit. So what was Steve's success? Why did it happen? He'll tell you that secret. Just watch. 
Steve went from being thousands of dollars in debt to running a business that beat out Fortune 500 companies for multi-million dollar contracts. So how did he do it? He says it's all because of his late wife, Linda. I learned from her a lot about obedience. She was quicker than me. Steve had been working a low salary job as a defense contractor. Linda was a stay-at-home mom. Credit card bills began to pile up. That's when a church elder told Steve to get on board with his wife and start tithing. Within a few months after that decision, Steve was named Salesman of the Year and given a huge bonus. That was evidence right away that God was going to bless me as I would obey his word. Within a few years, he and a partner started a company selling equipment parts to the military. In 2002, they scored a major multi-million dollar defense contract. What it did was increase my faith tremendously in every aspect, including tithing. As Steve earned more money, he started giving more away. One of his favorite places to support is CBN. I love the testimonies because those are real people that have experienced real challenges and God met them in their need. Steve and his partner sold his company in 2017, two years before Linda passed away. Now semi-retired, Steve has written a book where he shares the secret to his success, the one Linda taught him many years ago. Just be a giver. The word says to do it, do it. Just give. As they say, you cannot outgive God. He's got it right. You can't give, give God. God, the only time we're told to, to prove the Lord or test him is by our giving. He said, prove me with your tithes and offerings if I won't open the windows of heaven and pour you out such a blessing you can't contain it. So what we're asking you to do is trust God and join the 700 Club or whatever, because we're going to do everything that we can here to help people around the world. We want to help the poor, the needy, the hungry, the, the homeless, the destitute. We want to be there for them. And Operation Blessing is just one of the things we do. So pick up your phone, call in so you can count on me. And again, it'll be my pleasure to send you a copy of I Walk with the Living God, or you can get an audio uh, of the uh, book, and people seem to like that, and so you can be in your car driving and, and listening. Okay. That's such great response yes, to that. Before we go to email, I just want to remind all of you once more that next Wednesday, February 17th, we're going to have a special edition of the 700 Club. It will be featuring your email questions. So if you have a question for Pat, call the number that you see there on your screen. It's a different number than our usual one, but it is toll free. It's 1-800-677-7884. You can call today only from now until 5 p.m. Eastern time this evening to leave your voicemail questions. So let me give you that number again. It's 800-677-7884. And Pat will be answering your voicemails next Wednesday, February the 17th, right here on the 700 Club. Oh, and today okay. he's going to answer okay. your email questions All right. right now. Okay, you ready? Pat, this first one comes from Helen, who says, Pat, how can I, as an American, protest Trump's impeachment trial? I am appalled that once again, the Democrats are wasting taxpayers' money and time. Why can't we all try to meet in the middle and save our country from destruction? Um, folks, uh, it's real simple. Let your congressman, your senator know that you are opposed to that stand and that they're going to catch wrath from the voters next election. The one thing that congressmen like to do is to stay in office. <laughs> and the one thing that frightens them is they hear from several of their constituents. So what can you do? Get together a bunch of people, especially blue collar people, not just business people, but blue collar people, the working class and let them write letters to their congressmen and say, look, I've had enough of this. Stop wasting the money of the people and, and help me with the problems in my life. And you say, how can you do something? That's how you do it, all right? Okay, this is Hilda who says, are the people in heaven and hell looking at us and seeing what we're doing? If so, how can the ones in heaven be happy if they have unsaved loved ones on earth? Uh, I don't think they're watching us. I, 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 at least I, I think it's a little intrusive into our privacy. But I do know from the story of uh, Davies and, the, and Lazarus that, uh, uh, you know, he said, I've got brothers 
and sisters, can I get, and Abraham said, there's a great gulf between us fixed. They can't come to you, and, I, and you can't go to them. But, he, but they, he said, well, they've got Moses, and they've got the prophets. If they won't hear them, they won't hear those somebody rises from the dead. But the answer is no, they're not watching over you. And, and, but I'm sure it grieves them that people are not going to be going to heaven. They want people to go to heaven, and you know, but they, once you die, you die, all right? Okay, this is William who says, Hi, Pat, I'm very concerned because my parents claim to be Christians but do not follow biblical practice. They say they do not believe every part of the Bible as the 100% Word of God, and I'm concerned that this will send them to hell. I've tried to get them to church and to watch the 700 Club, but they refuse. They say they believe in God, but sometimes I wonder, what should I say to them to help them? Um, well, I think you should find a scripture but just the fact that they say we believe in God, the devil believes in God. So, the, the, you know, that's not enough. They've got to be born again, except a man be born again. I'd show them that part of the scripture and say, Here, here's what it says. Look at that. Except a man be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of, of God, period. So it hasn't got anything to do with whether or not they believe all the Bible or don't believe the Bible. That, that's not what saves people. What saves them is believing that Jesus Christ died for their sins and they receive Him as Savior and make Him Lord of their lives and are born again. That's what they've got to do. All right. This is Linda who says, Do people that are in hell who didn't accept Jesus as their Savior but were good moral people here on earth, do they have the same punishment as someone like Hitler? <laughs> well, I tell you, hell is pretty horrible whether you're a quote good person or not because <clears throat> the, 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 the Lord talks about a lake of fire. He talks about demonic spirits. He talks about torment forever. And so the fact that one, one is a little hotter than the other, I, I just don't think that's the question that we need to even be concerned about. It's all horrible. Hell is horrible for the, for the, quote, good moral people who don't accept Jesus and for the Hitlers and the bad guys. All right. This is Janice Pat who says, what age will we be in heaven? If we die as a child, will we be a child in heaven? Or if we die at 100 years old, will we be 100 in heaven? Well, the Bible says we'll see him as he is. And when he died, he was like about 32 years old. And I, I, I've, it's my feeling, and I don't have any real scripture to back it up, but that um, somebody that dies at 100 degrees, 100 years old, will come out like a young man at 30, and <laughs> somebody who is three years old will come out as somebody at 30. That's my feeling, but I, I don't have any scripture to back it up. But it says we will be like him because we'll see him as he is. Sorry. This is Tom who says, my wife is separated from me and says I need to let God work on me and prune me. I admit I have been emotionally abusive to her. I never knew how much this would hurt me until she left. I'm willing to let God work within me. How will I know that he's finished with me to the extent that my wife will want to be with me again? <laughs> Look, when you have joy in the Lord and when, you, when the presence of God is a blessing and you enjoy reading the Bible and you're living for the Lord, then, then you'll know in your own heart. But I, I cannot tell you what's going to please your wife because you're married to her and I'm not. So how, how can I give you the answer? But why don't you try reconciliation? But so, look, get your act together and look, whatever you're doing that was wrong, apologize and say, look, I'm trying to reform. Would you please forgive me and come back? I need you. All right. That's all the time we have for today, but that great questions. A lot of good, good answers. questions. Thank and you. Next Wednesday will be the big day, Wednesday right? Wednesday will be day after, I mean, hour after hour of, of wonderful <laughs> questions. Well, today's Power Minute is from the book of Romans. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Well, tomorrow, we've got a sinister story about the world of sex slavery. A former victim shares her shocking story. You don't want to miss that. And uh, for Terry and me, this is Pat Robertson. And thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for giving us the privilege of being in your home. And thank you for watching. So we look forward to seeing you at the same time tomorrow. Bye-bye. Tomorrow, trapped. He began to tell me things like, no one is looking for you. In the world of sex trafficking. This is my new life, and I just better accept it. The threats. 
If you go back home, I know exactly where you're going to be at, and I'm going to find you, and I'll kill you. And her daring escape. I'm going to try to run and live today, or today he's going to kill me, and I'm going to die. On tomorrow's 700 Club. It's like a double punch. You get the COVID, then you get the hurricane. People have lost just about everything, business too. There's been no electricity now for days. We had to stand in long lines to get food for COVID and everything, and then this hit. Pastor Jerry Snyder and his wife Hope partnered with Operation Blessing to host a food and supplies distribution at their church. We're giving out fresh produce. We're giving out products that they need to clean. We're giving out food, trash bags, dog food, all the things that they need. Thank you, Operation Blessing. Thank you, every partner that sows, that gives, that cares. We feel it right here in Southwest Louisiana. Thank you. People around the world need your help. When you partner with CBN, you rescue children and adults from despair, and you give them a promising future. Please watch for this mailing and remember to send in your pledge. When we all come together to help, miracles happen.